Okay, Jeremy, it's your first episode, so just take it easy, figure out what you're doing, don't overwhelm yourself. Now, what's the game? Ah, oh, fuck. This is Brand New Relic, the monthly series where I finally play the classic games I never got to try. First off, some major plot spoilers ahead for Final Fantasy VII, so if you've somehow avoided knowing anything about this... 23-year-old game, then... congratulations. The genesis for this series, well, not that. It's, yeah, I guess more like that. It all started last April. Quarantine was underway, Tiger King was all the rage, animals were crossing, and the much-anticipated Final Fantasy VII Remake was finally released on PlayStation 4. And I wanted to play it, except that I never played the original Final Fantasy VII. <gasps> or indeed any Final Fantasy game. <gasps> but I did see the Final Fantasy movie in the theaters. <gasps> yes, I'm the one. I've been hearing about Final Fantasy VII since I was a teenager, sitting in my room listening to Ben Folds 5 while playing Sonic and Knuckles. Now I'm an adult, sitting in my room listening to Ben Folds 5 while playing Sonic and Knuckles. So it's time to finally sit down and give Final Fantasy VII a try. And what better way to do so than under the watchful eye of the internet? So first... I know that this is the seventh entry in the Final Fantasy franchise. Nailing it so far. I don't know much about this game, or indeed the series as a whole. Like I said, I did watch the movie 19 years ago, and it was about people who did things. What are we going to do now? Nothing. This mission is over. I also remember being in GameStop back in the 90s and seeing that majestic three-disc box and a quote on the back that called it quite possibly the greatest game ever made. Right next to Croc Legend of the Gobos. And I know about the big spoilery moment regarding the death of... Is it Eris? Aerith? Ariel? Her. And I know the game's been ported to... well everything, but I want the original PS1 experience. Which means I'm using an emulator. <laughs> I know, I know, it's just until I get a game capture card, but trust me, I'm not using any save states, it just means that from time to time, things like this will happen. Not now, Chris the Volunteer, I'm busy! But I have my controller and I'm ready for some 1997 goodness. Let's do this! treated with a very beautiful opening credit sequence that executive produce executive produce and already my PlayStation 4 brain has to be rewired to use circle for interacting so the story kicks off with a guy named Barrett and a guy named cloud I'm playing a guy named cloud I'm uh I'm calling him Jem so Barrett joins my party by jumping into my body like he's Patrick Swayze and Ghost and we're striking back at the corrupt organization Shinra by committing domestic terrorism. Okay. Then we get a Super Metroid-style countdown, and why are these guys challenging us to a fight when there's a countdown to an explosion? Run! Okay, I've never played a Final Fantasy game, and yet I've definitely heard that tune. That's iconic. So we blow up this reactor, which feels problematic, but I'm sure we did it during a time where very few people were... Oh. Wow, okay. We're the, uh... We're the heroes, huh? So then we meet Tifa, who's a former lover, or best friend, or current lover. I'm not sure what's going on between these two. She joins our party, and hey, wouldn't you know it, her victory pose looks like this. Why am I not surprised? And then our trio has the exciting task of pushing buttons at the same time. Thrilling. So then we finally meet Eris. That's her name. I wasn't sure if it was... Wait, I'm... I'm so confused. Anyway, we meet the flower girl, Eris, who maybe you remember as the slum drunk? Game, what are you doing? And she asked me to be her bodyguard in exchange for a date. And I... You get these weird pseudo flashbacks as you follow Eris to her place where you're already meeting her mother. This is all so sudden. And we find out Shinra wants to find the promised land so they can frack it for its energy, and Eris is a magical orphan who can help them find it. That old story. And then it turns out I'm really bad at sneaking out of the house. Just like when I was a kid. Sure enough, Eris finds you and joins your party, and then before you know it, you're fighting sentient houses that drop atomic bombs on you. Video games, everybody. 
So then I got stuck on this screen for a ridiculous amount of time before I realized that you can run on that pipe. Then we catch up with Tifa, who's going undercover as a concubine, and she convinces you to... Oh. Oh, 1997. Oh, we're gonna get transphobic here, aren't we? Oh, goodness. Hey, you remember Final Fantasy VII, the game where you challenge a guy to squat to the gym so that you can get a wig to go with your dress? So as a concubine, you try to avoid these creepers who somehow have Nintendo Switches in the mid-90s, and then you make your way to Don Corneo, which is not a Beavis and Butthead spoof of The Godfather, but instead is... Well, I'm never gonna unsee that. And this all leads to a showdown with Shinra and a fight with... a Looney Tunes fan. Back home, book. You fail to stop Shinra, who retaliates for your terrorism by destroying your entire village, which is just extreme. And then you have a very somber moment that's hard to take seriously next to this thing. Then we break into Shinra headquarters and go up 60 flights of stairs, which I definitely turned into a race. Ha <laughs> ha! Eat my dust, losers! You- wait, what? how did they get there? Also, you can't just throw out the R word like that. So then I get stuck on this terrible section trying to bypass the guards, only to find out that I can't get off on 69. <clears throat> I also find out that it's possible to attack yourself. I'm kicking my ass, divine! These include space program and the budget. Final Fantasy VII predicted the Space Force. So then I find a nap room, which I really want in my actual life. And then we meet Hojo, who I swear is a character in the Matrix movies. He's doing experiments on a creature called Genova, who what on earth is that? And that's your response? This whole thing is stupid? One of the experiments is this creature named Red 13, or Red Z! He hates that name, so I'll give him a new one. Perfect. My cat's name is Mittens. So we confront the Shinra president, and that guy's name is Rude? That's just setting him up to be a jerk. And then... Oh. This turned into a horror game real quick. Let's just check on the president, and... Oh. You okay, buddy? Whoever this Sephiroth is, I'm not a fan. So then we meet the president's son, Rufus, who's not too concerned about his dad dying, and wow, Barrett, too soon! Rufus is real transparent about leading people with fear, and then... Oh, that's... Wait... I have to go all the way back to... Oh, right. I'm playing a 90s JRPG. That's gonna happen a lot, isn't it? So then we get on a motorcycle... And we suddenly see where Ride to Hell Retribution got its inspiration. Three humans get into hand-to-hand -hand combat with a tank, and suddenly we're in an open world! We find out more about our protagonist, who is from... Nibbleheim? Sure. And we see the time he and Sephiroth were camp buddies. Ooh, nice stats! But it turns out Sephiroth's not totally evil, he's a very sympathetic person. Or he's dabbing. And then we explore... Nibbleheim, including Tifa's house, where we find... Okay. And then I jam on the piano for a bit. Before we find ourselves in a room with what is that? Sephiroth renews his library card and we're back in present day, heading to a chocobo farm where... I love video games so much. And it turns out we can't buy a chocobo, we have to buy bait to catch one in the wild, which is not fun. But then you're riding on a chocobo and everything is perfect and amazing and... So Sephiroth can easily kill 30-foot serpents. Cool. Cool. Then we dress up as a soldier in order to infiltrate Shinra, in which I learned that I'd make a terrible soldier. But I can make him dance Gangnam style. Oh, 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 oh. Then we're on a boat when... Why does this keep happening when we're around? We're fighting Genova, or part of Genova. I don't know how this works. All I know is it sucks. And then we're in another town that has a poet in a bikini who definitely deserves her own game. We head to a beach resort town where Hojo's apparently getting some much needed R&R. &R. And after a few stops, we go to Vegas in the sky. There's a basketball mini game. you can arm wrestle, you can play the saddest arcade game ever, we meet the owner Dio who, uh... You wanna put on some clothes, buddy? You ride Buzz Lightyear Astro Blasters, a weird cat in a weird suit with the weird name of Kate Sith joins your party, and then... Okay, this is getting to be ridiculous. Wait, did Barrett do this? Barrett, no! So then we're sent to prison, and we find out Barrett didn't do it. Oh, I knew it wasn't you, Barrett. I didn't actually know that. And then we wander the desert like Lawrence of Arabia before finding Barrett's best friend, Dine, who's a bit upset. Wait, no, am I... No! I have so much literal ground to cover! So Barrett defeats Dine, who asks him to never make his daughter Marlene cry, which, as a new parent, that's, uh... 
that's not how that works. Then we win a chocobo race and we get congratulated by Dio, who's apparently a very busy man. Yeah, too busy for clothes, Dio. Then we go to Gungaga, not to be confused with Gonzaga, where we find out Mittens is actually named Inaki, even though he asked me to name him Mittens. Then we journey through a cave, fight some battles, and find out that the father of Mittens was a hero. So we're back to Nibbleheim, where these weirdos are hanging out. And I get a safe puzzle that I give up on during the first clue. We get some weird cryptic messages from Sephiroth, then we go to Mount Nibble, fight some large creatures, get something called a gem ring, which I swear I didn't know about when I named this character Gem, and then we're in Rocket Town, which is a town with a rocket. Real original. We meet Sid, who's a bit of an abusive jerk, and then we fight this guy who... <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. And then before you know it, we're stealing property and inviting abusers into our party. Our heroes, everyone. And then... Yeah, I'm lost. To find our next course of action, we have to locate this weapon maker in a random part of the map. Because of course. Turns out the weapon we need is back in Sky Vegas, which means more Dio! Who makes us battle for his entertainment. Keep going? Of course! And then... We go on a date. And it's really lovely. We even get to be in a stage play where every actor enters by spinning, totally accurate, and you can ask about the princess's measurements. Who wrote this play? Neela Butte? And then you can kiss the king. Okay, so not Neela Butte. And then you find out that Kate Sith is a spy. But it's fine, I guess. We make our way to the Temple of the Ancients, where we find out that Sephiroth is going to deep impact the planet, cloud starts glitching, and Kate Sith makes the ultimate sacrifice, and... No, I don't want to feel emotional about Kate Sith. They're a spy. I'm not gonna... Okay, fine game. I'm feeling emotions. So then I get possessed and hand Sephiroth the exact thing he needs. Come on, me! And wait, Kate Sith is back? Who wrote this? J.J. Abrams? We get caught in a screenshot from Mist, and Eris pieces out. We track her down to this haunting and emotional area where a jumping mechanic feels wildly out of place. I get possessed again and almost kill Eris, but somehow stop myself and... Oh. Oh, there it is. That super emotional moment where... Hold on. Phoenix Down brings people back to life, right? I have a lot of Phoenix Down. Why can't I use my Phoenix Down? So Kate Sith gets to come back, but not Eris? And then we finish Act 1. About halfway through the game. Act 2 begins, and we properly grieve Eris's death by snowboarding! We cross Frozen Tundra, climb Mount Everest, fight an icicle, Tifa, it's freezing, put some pants on! We make it to the Northern Cave, where we fight Sephiroth, take away his main power, and yes, don't make the same mistake, give it to someone else. Then we find out that flashback to... Nibbleheim wasn't true at all? Turns out it was Goku the entire time? Worse than that, I'm one of Hojo's experiments? And then Barrett thanks me for trusting him with Sephiroth's power by... handing it right back. Good job, buddy. The planet decides to fight back against Sephiroth by releasing... Zords. Our protagonist disappears into the life stream while Barrett and Tifa are arrested and taken back to a president with orange hair who always makes the wrong decisions. Interesting. So Shinra tries to stop one of the Zords by giving it a shot from their big cannon. <clears throat> The first major fight between two women in the game is a slapping match. Okay. Our heroes escape on an airship, and I just realized what the select button does after 24 hours of gameplay. So we randomly fly around the map until we catch up with our protagonist, who says such memorable phrases as a gurk, but he needs some time to recover, so we have a fight on a train, some real-time strategy on a mountain, in which I'm reminded that I'm terrible at real-time strategy, Fort Condor loses its condor, so I guess it's just called Fort now, another village is destroyed, and our protagonist becomes a Macy's float as he gets his memories back. Tifa always used to be with this threesome. You know what? Good for her. We track down Shinra, have a fight in an elevator, Captain America style, go down to Rapture, commandeer a submarine, and then we're in space! SPACE! For like two seconds. We find the key to the Ancients, have a fight with a Zord, the orange-haired president makes yet another bad decision, we have a boss fight that took me forever, and we find out that Hojo is Sephiroth's father? That's impossible! And then he dies. So now it's time to save the world, but not before spending the night with Tifa. Aw, I love a good end-of-the-world hookup. And it's the end of Act 2. Right before the end of the game. So in Act 3, we fight a monster that attacks with shave and a haircut. And this cutie patootie whose weapon is everyone's grudge. And then our hero says, let's mosey. Okay. We fight Genova for the last time, and then... It's time to fight Sephiroth. Whose power is making people dance, I guess.
We face off against him and his ability to destroy the entire universe. We're all gonna need a lot more sunscreen. And after many, many, many resets, Sephiroth is finally defeated, we barely escape, the planet stops Deep Impact from happening, and... Wait. That's it? Was humanity saved? Do we ever find out? We get a Marvel post credit scene where we discover that the planet's okay, and a Windows 95 screensaver takes us out. So the game is over, I recorded 40 hours of gameplay, and there are two people that could have joined my party that I didn't even know about. Whew! Did you follow all that? Because I didn't. Why did I choose this as my first game? Well... Overall, Final Fantasy VII is pretty phenomenal. It definitely screams 1997. 1997! Particularly in the cutscenes. The sprites haven't held up that well over time, particularly them going from looking like adults to the most adorable little I just want to squeeze their cheeks. But the backgrounds are great. Almost every screen is gorgeous to look at, and in particular I love these battle animations. They're downright lyrical at times. To go from this... to this... must have been mind-blowing. Although some of those animations... they take their time. Oh great, Sephiroth's destroying the galaxy, I'll go make some dinner. Sound-wise, the music is wonderful. I'd heard from many gamers over the years about how great the soundtrack is, and it's good to know that they weren't lying. About that. Story-wise, it's interesting. It's complex and hard to follow at times, which seems like it's on brand, but it never loses its urgency. Doc Burford had an excellent thread on Twitter last month about how a lot of open-world games lack that feeling of what happens next. That's not the case here. Each push forward has a narrative reason and clues are provided to get to the next location. And you can even recap the story at certain points, so I didn't get lost. Except for that weapons maker! The way it handles flashbacks and memories feels dynamic and original, and it does a great job of balancing its goofiness with moments that are genuinely impactful. And I really didn't expect the ambiguity of the ending. I have to say I loved how open-ended it was, leaving it up to us to decide whether or not humanity was actually saved. Until apparently they made a movie that ruined that. What I think I loved most, though, were the little details. From the treasure chest in prison that's already been looted, to the folks grieving a tragic event that happened before we ever got there, to everyone having an opinion on the world possibly ending, to the henchman that never got to do a special victory dance, to the fact that every dog can be interacted with. My favorite moments show that this is a world that exists beyond just our little gang. Those moments certainly felt more urgent and fun than the combat. Speaking of which... This. I heard this a lot. I've never been a fan of random encounters in RPGs, and the frequency of the battles here tried my patience at times. Alright, great, cool, man. Oh, come on! And because this is a PlayStation 1 game, that means we get both unskippable cutscenes and long sections between save points, which can be frustrating when you have to sit through unskippable cutscenes. And while the progression here was for the most part fine, there were some battles that suddenly spiked in difficulty. While my final in-game time was somewhere in the 30 hour mark, I definitely logged about 10 more hours just from having to replay or rewatch various sections after dying. If this were 1997, well first I'd be talking endlessly about Goodwill Hunting, but I could see myself finishing the game. In 2020, though, if I hadn't challenged myself to finish it for this show, I probably would have logged off somewhere in the Reno Rude Elena battle and just watched the ending on YouTube. Which isn't necessarily the fault of the game, but makes it feel less compelling than, say, Chrono Trigger, which is one of my all-time favorites. While the turn-based combat is okay, the controls made it difficult at times to target the right enemy, leading to those infuriating moments where I either attacked myself or my teammate, or even healed the person that I was fighting. Oh, uh, you're welcome. The game also tries to break up that combat by flirting with a bunch of other genres. We get first-person shooters, racing, real-time strategy, survival, and while it's certainly different from the grind of turn-based combat, none of it feels substantial enough to truly belong in this world. More of a time filler than an exciting change of pace. And while I love the look of the pre-rendered scenes, it did mean that there were times when I didn't know I could enter a specific place or walk on a certain surface. Like that pipe! The select button helped with that once I discovered it, but not always. There are also a lot of things that don't quite hold up, like some provocative outfits, including Dio, the transphobic comedy of the concubine moment, and Barrett's language, which verges on problematic being the only black character in the game. Having said all that, though... Yeah, I get it. Final Fantasy VII is epic, and clearly represented a huge leap forward in gaming. 
For me, I know I truly loved a game when I'm thinking about it afterward. Some games I've never gotten out of my head, while some I barely remember playing. And I'm pretty sure I'll be thinking about Final Fantasy VII for a while. But is it quite possibly the greatest game ever made? Maybe not for me personally. I think there's a lot about it that, while revolutionary for the time, hasn't quite held up two decades later, but I can see why it holds a special place for a lot of gamers. It was a great introduction to the Final Fantasy franchise, and it makes me excited to try more entries in the series. Overall, I'm glad I took the time to finish it, even if it was frustrating along the way. Now, time to play the remake. I hear it's only the first third of the original story, so it shouldn't take me that long to- ARE YOU KIDDING ME?! I'd like to thank my very first patrons on Patreon. You all showed your support before the first episode even aired, and for that, I'm super grateful. A special shout-out goes to Brianne Shaw, who was not only my first patron, but got to see this video five days early. To get early access to videos, as well as check out bonus content and polls that help decide future videos, make sure to check out my Patreon, and also follow me on Twitter for future updates. Do you have a favorite classic game? Chances are I haven't played it. Tell me in the comments, and it could be in a future episode. And of course, make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell to find out when I post the next video. For my next episode, I'll be using the month of October to check out one of the most notorious horror sequels of all time. So until then, thank you so much for watching.